Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Angie. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Uh, really cool to be here. Um, thank everybody. I thank everybody that um, helped get me here, and um, that was wonderful. Um, thank you, Brian. And um, I just get more. Yeah, you know, I don't know if anybody. You know, of course, y'all didn't. Y'all weren't looking at me, but um, nodding my head to just everything he was saying. You know, um, first off, that we get to recover. He's a recovered alcoholic. Not cured. No. Um, but um, that was the one thing that, that was the first thing that I heard after eight years of being in and out, in and out, in and out of AA, not working any steps, and then getting so sick that I uh, had to go to a hospital. And that was the first thing that I heard that just, what was that? What would you say? <laughs> Explain that to me. And I had somebody take me in the book where it explained it. That gave me hope. Um, so right when he said that, it's, it's just, that's everything, you know, that's kind of the, the, the point, you know, let's, let's get well so we can recover so we can help other people recover and live life and get on with our life. Um, my sobriety date is March the 25th of 2006. Um, I, uh, I'm from Dallas, Texas. I live in, I'm a, I actually live in Seal Beach now. Y'all, y'all have such a beautiful state. I can't sit still. I can't, I need to like stop moving. But I moved here from Dallas about three years ago and moved to Dana Point. Lived in the Laguna Niguel a little bit. Now I'm in Seal Beach. Who knows where I'll be, where I'll be next. Um, but, um, you know, the drive up here, it went by really, really fast. Um, and I drove up here today, and I can't tell you how cool it is just to turn on my radio really loud and, and drive and actually notice, you know, notice things. I think you called it the grapevine driving through. Really beautiful, really cool. Uh, when my mind was so always on me in the past when I was drinking, and um, that was actually driving through the grapevine would have been pretty cool when I was drinking. I would have pulled over probably. Um, but, you know, and, and I got here really fast, and I was, you know, jamming out to, y'all don't laugh, but Adamant <laughs> and 38 Special. And if you're under 30, you have no clue who he is, and it's okay. Um, um, but 38 Special rocks. They're great. <laughs> but it was just a really great experience. And knowing what I was, what I was coming to do and um, to, to just maybe offer a little bit of hope. Mm-hmm. But I think the coolest thing about tonight and the coolest thing about this whole weekend is going to be just the people that I get to meet, you know, just being in a new place and meeting some really cool, really cool people. Uh, I am from Dallas, Texas, been here three years. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I'm a big book thumper. I am a big book thumper, and I'm proud to say it. And um, I used to make fun of big book thumpers. Um, I... I really didn't even know what it meant. I mean, I kind of had the idea that they just, you know, really liked this book. Um, (laughs) And I'm, I'm absolutely um, proud to say that I am one. Um, So it's where the solution, it's where the solution is. So uh, I do. I study this book. If you guys could see my book, it's it's dog tagged and and highlighted, and uh, because I keep reading it and I keep learning, and um, I will never stop. I will never stop learning. Um, and, and have an opportunity to come here and do, do something like this. I, I always learn stuff, always, always, about myself, about God, about other people. I learn stuff about the program. Um, so it's a, a very cool opportunity, I thank everybody. Uh, I want to share some of my story with you. A uh, big, huge part of my story is, um, is, is what happened and what I'm like now, though. That's where I really try to focus uh, because what I was like, um, and, and what I was like, what happened and what I'm like now, because it, life didn't change. Life kept happening. I, I was the one that, that changed. Uh, what I was like was, um, 
a scared, frantic, I would say, about everything, uh, insecure, lonely, no direction, felt useless, full of fear kind of person that had to drink to even feel okay. I um, That's what I was like. That's it. Um, people didn't want to be around me there in the end. Um, I uh, started, I come from a great family. I from, come from a wonderful family. I'm the youngest of four. I didn't have my first drink until I was about 13. And I'm not kidding. It, it was a sip, actually. I split one beer with, like, six or seven other girls. And nothing happened. You know, I I hadn't found my solution to life and all of life's problems at 13. But uh, it it was kind of fun. You know, I uh, had my next drink at 16, drank here and there a little bit like your average high school. I, it just didn't become a problem for me. I know I was born with this. Um, but it didn't, it didn't, uh, it didn't start causing problems for me. It didn't start causing problems for me until my young teens, my, my early 20s. And I, and I noticed that, uh, it worked drinking more, you know, um, fill in that hole of just really fear. That was the most, that was the main thing going on. Uh, I could talk better. I could, I could uh, actually make people laugh, I guess, because I was just an idiot. But I, I could um, dance better. I could flirt better. Uh, it, it just, it worked. You know, it worked. And that's why I did it. it. It worked. I kept doing it and it worked. I think that's why we all uh, keep doing it um, in the beginning. And, I uh, drank weird, you know, started drinking weird. When you start hiding it and you start, um, people start making excuses of why they have to leave you early because <laughs> they don't want to be around you anymore. Um, when, when we're going to happy hour and the other people are leaving at 7 to go to soccer practice and stuff and they're calling me a little bit later and it's like 2 and I'm still at the bar, you know, I, you just, I, on a on a certain level, that's why we, I started lying about it. On a certain level, you know it's just not right. It's just kind of weird. Um, but I, I don't want to talk too much either about the stuff that happens. Stuff happens when alcoholics drink. It's called consequences. Uh, DWIs, stuff like that, jail. You know, we, we experience that, and the, and the interesting thing is some people don't, you know. Some people don't. That's why I am, am big time on big book studies, and I do not attend discussion meetings anymore. It seems to be a lot of a lot of uh, talking about our stuff that happened, and um, I think it's very important. Our story is very important when we're either sharing it from a podium or working with another alcoholic one-on-one, so at working with others, that chapter's all about. But at a meeting, um, I want to talk about how to get better. You know, the solution. And the thing is, is when we share our, uh, kind of cut my story off there for a minute, but when we kind of share too many stories in a meeting, there are people in there that, that they haven't been to prison. You know, they haven't ever stolen anything. They haven't ever shot anybody. And um, I know that because I was that person going into the meeting not able to relate to these stories. I could relate to what was happened to me internally, you know, this internal malady that I learned later what it is, this spiritual condition, this uh, this yuckiness going on inside of me. Uh, I could relate to that. but uh, And then some people can relate to the prison and, the war, and, and all the war stories and all that. And then that gives them a great idea of something that they did, and so they want to top it. And, so they, and the meeting just gets way off. Um, but just like I just did with my story. But... Um, I have some jobs, but I'm not one of, you know, while I'm drinking in my early 20s, but I'm not one of these people that can wake up with a hangover and go to work. Um, I just can't do it. Just couldn't do it. So I would just not go. And that, I had a lot of jobs. (laughs) I had a lot. I started a lot and I quit a lot and I started a lot and I quit a lot. Uh, absolutely selfish. I didn't see that at that point. It, to me, it's like 
I'm sick. I can't go. I'm sure this happens to them all the time. They have people not showing up all the time. I'm just another one. You know, um, uh, my family would take care of me. I didn't, I didn't see the absolute selfishness going on. I, um, I, I do get a DWI. I'm drinking and driving. I am, I am driving. Um, I, I get a job as a nanny, and I'm actually driving these children around um, drinking. I, embarrassed to say, but it's the absolute truth. I really did enjoy drinking and driving. Hate to say it. It makes me want to cry to say it, but it's the truth. And um, I, uh, luckily, when I got pulled over, I did not have these kids with me, but I am thrown in jail, and um, I am sent to AA as punishment. Uh, and um, I just don't get it. I know I drink a lot. I know that I like to party probably more than the average person. I know I just like to feel different, uh, to feel better, but I have no idea what it means to be an alcoholic, if that's a bad word, and, and that's just not me. But I'm going to go to these meetings because I have to, and I've got community service to do and whatever. It's just what I have to do. Uh, so I um, start going to meetings. Um, a lot of stuff happened in between, but like I said, it's 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 just stuff. Um, a lot of moving, a lot of um, trying to control my drinking, um, and and actually being able to stay sober for a little bit, you know, out of fear, but um, but never seriously thinking it was a problem. So never with the intention of quitting permanently, you know, just kind of slowing down, just kind of I just need to be good for a while, kind of thing. Um, but I, I move a lot. I, I try to change friends. I'm, you know, I'm dating losers. And so I start trying to date cool guys and, and smart guys because maybe that's why I'm getting a little bit out of control. Um, but so I'm going to these AA classes and uh, these AA meetings and I kind of just want to, um, kind of paint a picture of what it looked like, um, for seven to eight years going going to these meetings and trying to stay sober on the fellowship of AA and trying to rely on the meetings uh, because I just didn't know any better. Uh, I would go to meetings and sit and really be, I knew it was coming around to me because it was one of those meetings where you go around and you share, you know, it's your turn, it's your turn, it's your turn, you're around the circle. And really the whole meeting, I'm thinking about me. And I'm thinking about what I'm going to say. What am I going to say that's really funny or really smart or that's going to make everybody think that everybody, everything's cool with me? So I'm missing the whole meeting anyway, which is really not a big deal. But uh, and, I, and I say, you know, whatever I say, life's great. Usually life's great. And, and I, I talk about my day, you know, what happened that day. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go to a tennis game tonight and husband softball game later. And like anyone cares, but... Um, I can do that for a little while. I know that I'm supposed to get a sponsor. I get a sponsor. Um, she says, we're going to, you know, get started in the steps, but I want you to read, you know, read first, read, read, read. And it seems like I was reading, just reading, just reading, just reading, just reading. Um, and we weren't really ever talking about it. So I didn't understand. I didn't understand it, but I was told just to go to 90 meetings in 90 days also. So I'm relying on reading. Going to a meeting every day, no matter what. Uh, I was also told to stay really busy, so don't think about drinking. Um, I was told a lot of a lot of stuff um, that I just didn't know. I thought that that's what AA was. You know, you just you just you're gonna have to go through life not drinking, and it's gonna pretty much suck. But but if you stay somewhat away from the alcohol, try to avoid it, that that you'll be okay. I mean, you, at least you won't be drinking. You might be miserable as hell, but at least you won't be drinking. And um, I don't know how I'm going to do that. I mean, I, I kind of believe that the people in this meeting are doing it. I don't know. Maybe they're lying, but I don't know how I'm going to do it. But it is like the only, the only, because things have gotten really, really bad. Um, and... Um, I'll back up a little bit. I I can't stay sober for a certain amount of time, so I quit going to the meetings because I just can't stand them. And then I get into some more trouble. This is maybe over a three-year period. I get into some more trouble. Um, you know, lose some family. Family members don't want to have anything to do with me. 
Um, really great idea. Decided that getting married was, was. I mean, we totally wanted to get married, and and but I also down deep inside, and so did my husband, thought that it would it would change things. Thought that well, this would be also good for your drinking because probably you'd be happier, and then we could start a family, and so it all just kind of worked out perfectly. Um, it didn't get. By the way, he's a wonderful man. He supported me throughout this whole thing. He knew he was an I was an alcoholic when he married me, and he married my ass anyway. God bless him. Um, but I can't stay sober on my own. The meetings aren't. I, I start going to therapy. I start going to some therapy. Um, but I, I still can't pull it off. And every time I start drinking, I drink more, and I drink more, and I drink more. And it's get it's a progressive disease. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. And I'm drinking for like a matter of five days now instead of just having like a two-night party. It's like a five-day party, uh, usually by myself because I quit going out, and um, which was actually pretty fun. Um, it was all about me. It was all about me. And uh, I, I got to go back to AA because it's the only game in town. You know, it's just the only thing left. Um, the self-help books didn't work, and I just figure i got to give it another shot. Uh, well, plus I get a DWI and I'm sent back also. <laughs> but So I um, I start leaving meetings early because I just can't stand them. Um, now, I'm, now, there were some good stuff being said in this meetings every now and then about steps, you know, but I'm so in the mindset now that I thought that was weird, you know, because that when they started talking about the steps or started talking about a spiritual experience, because I'm, I seriously, I'm like, well, what about your day? You know, but but how are you feeling today? <laughs> but I start, I start leaving meetings early, um, and I'm 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 leaving, I'm on purpose because everybody's watching me. I'm on purpose looking at my watch like I've got an appointment to be at in case anybody asks me why is Angie leaving early. Um, nobody cared. <laughs> But, uh, and I'm getting there late, and my, I still have my sponsor. Actually, I have a second sponsor now, but we are, um, I keep relapsing, so she keeps saying, well, you obviously don't get step one then, so we're going to take even longer to do it. Um, we were doing about a step, and I honestly can't remember, so I can't state, say this. It seems like I was on that first step a million times. It was over a month. It was, it was, it was maybe not two months, but it was over a month. But I couldn't stay sober for a month, and I'll tell you why. I can't. But so she, her, her thought was, "You're going to take longer to do it. I want you to go look up the word powerless. I want you to write a paragraph out about it. I want you to, um, you know, all this, all this stuff is just not in my book. It's, it's, it's not in my big book of how to do step one or understanding step one, which is a question." <laughs> Um, so I just am becoming more and more hopeless. I am just going to be one of these that dies. And, you know, sitting up here can, can make jokes about it and stuff, but, um, and I, and maybe I clean up okay, but I was a, a really sick person. Um, weighed 20 pounds less than I do now, and, uh, I am hallucinating and um i'm i'm doing i'm drinking cooking sherry and red wine vinegar because it's the only thing in the house um mouthwash you know all that stuff that we do i am i'm stealing from people i am uh going to my dad's house and getting in his wine cellar and taking very nice stuff um i'm i'm stealing um it's it's not uh, it was pretty scary, you know. It, it's um, we can look back and we can laugh at some of the things we did, and thank God we have the amends process. We can go back and we can clean up that mess and we can make it right. But uh, to be detoxing at home and have your heart almost jump out of your throat because you can't breathe and you, you know, I didn't know to go to a hospital. I I I didn't know that that was the safest thing to do. I wish I had because I really was playing with fire. Um, so I'm getting really, really, really sick. And the only thing about that I haven't tried, I haven't tried working the steps in a timely fashion, like my big book 
translates to me. That's what it says to me. Uh, I am doing everything to try to stay away from the booze, but I can't. I think it's about willpower, and I can't seem to do that. I'm not going to weddings. I'm not going to parties. I'm not going to concerts. I'm not doing any fun stuff in life because I'm scared to death to drink. And then husband's going out of town, and I'm at the store in five minutes buying alcohol. Makes no sense. I am relying on on me, you know. I am thinking that this time it's going to be different every single time for eight years. I am thinking that this self-help book really is going to work this time. Church is really going to, I'm just going to get really, really into it. Joined a Bible study. You know, this is going to work this time. Um, moving again. I moved to San Francisco for a while, of all places, to, to try to clean up your act. <laughs> um, for six months, and I came back sicker than before and broke. The meetings aren't working. Um, the only thing I have not tried is, is treatment. <clears throat> but when that is suggested to me, I'm like, you're crazy. Because that, I mean, that's serious stuff. That's hospital. That's where really sick people go that have a really, really bad problem. And I'm 26. And I'm, you know, um, I'm drinking at home. And I'm not really bothering anybody except for me. I'm not really hurting anybody but me. But uh, when you're when you get to the point when you're drunk for 15 days and your in-laws come over and they will not leave until you say yes, and um, and you can't walk, and um, you know I've got beer stashed from the doghouse in the backyard to the attic to I mean frantically searching for it while the in-laws are there. Found some in the, in the washing machine. It's and I sit down after 14, 15 days of, of drinking, and I'm in my pajamas, and I don't think I've showered for four days. And I am drunk, and my husband is kneeling before me, and I'm in a rocking chair, and he's bawling, just saying, please just say yes. Please just go. I absolutely 100% know that I didn't say, okay, yes, I'll go. There's I, there's no way I said that. I was scared to death. There was no way I said that. But I said it, and he wouldn't let go back on my word. And before I knew it, my bag was packed, and I was walking down the sidewalk with my uh, mother-in-law on one side, father-in-law on the other, and I had a stuffed animal. Um, at, by this time, I'm 34. <laughs> so pathetic. You know, I, I've got a pillow under one arm, and... and, um, and um, stuffed animal and walk it and I can't and I can't hardly walk and I told him that if I can drink on the way up there I will go but but honestly it's because I knew that I physically needed it I mean I really did they thought that I just wanted to party more and have more fun when I've been puking all night long but I really knew what it did to me physically and I knew that I'm gonna kill somebody or or really really get in a bad place and I physically need it. And they called the doctor and the doctor said, yes, give it to her. She's going to treatment. Give her all she wants, actually. Um, I get to treatment and um, this is where the absolute solution comes in. I get to treatment and I'm detoxing for like eight or nine days. And the act of treatment doesn't do crap. I'm sorry. It gets you physically put away. And, and I'm sorry, that's just my opinion. My treatment center was fantastic. But I'm just saying that the act of going, you know, we hear a lot of people that go to rehab after rehab after rehab after rehab. The act of getting in your car and going, and I went to treatment and I'm going to get fixed. But if I don't do what I'm supposed to do there, that act of going isn't going to fix me, um, if that makes sense. Uh, but I had to get physically separated from the alcohol, and that's what treatment did for me. Um, got in a hospital where I was detoxed. And I could actually get my brain a little bit unfogged so I could start the recovery process. So treatment, you got to get away from it. I, I did. Serious alcohol, I, I really did. Couldn't do it with the beer stores down the street. So uh, I hear 
I'm, I go to this big book study finally in, uh, this morning, uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, and I hear this man introduce himself as a recovered alcoholic. And I'm, what? <laughs> what did you say? You arrogant. No. Um, and... <laughs> And I asked him later on, not that day, but I asked him later on what that meant, and he explained it to me. But what I heard that one hour, and I'm still, like, foggy-headed a little bit, shuffling around, and um, what I heard was what I'm going to um, share with you because it what gave me – I know there's, there's maybe only one or two newcomers in here, but it absolutely changed my life that day just hearing. I know that, you know – Thinking about this program and talking about it and reading it, it's, it's the action we take that's going to, to, to get us well. But what he said to me was that I had lost the power of choice. He, he fully explained to me what it meant to be powerless. He fully explained to me what it says in the doctor's opinion. He took me to the doctor's opinion. He opened it up. This is the book he gave me. And he went through the doctor's opinion with me. I was in AA for eight, I keep saying seven, eight, or nine, because honestly, I don't remember. <laughs> it was just such a in and out, in and out, in and out thing, and it doesn't really matter anyway. It was a long time. Um, I didn't know there was a doctor's opinion. I had no idea, because it was poor, b- before page one, probably, but I didn't know anything about the forwards. I knew nothing about the doctor's opinion. And he showed me where it talked about the phenomenon of craving, and he explained it to me. My body's just different. I have an allergy to alcohol. And he also explained how this is Jeanette. Alcoholism is not causal. Nothing that happened to me. My parents divorcing when I was six, that didn't make me, didn't cause me to be an alcoholic, and I thought that for a long time. I thought, man, if my dad had just been around to mold me into this balanced, wonderful, confident woman, I wouldn't date all these losers and drink. I mean, I, you know, it, it was not about that at all. Um, way up there on my family tree somewhere, there's, there's alcoholics. Um, I don't have many in my, my, my immediate family, but lots of hard drinkers. Um, but he explained this to me, and I, I understood it. Yeah, when I put a drink in my body... I set off this phenomenon of craving immediately. First step, immediately. First drop. And I am going to have another drink. That first drink just tells me the second one's going to be way better. And this happens pretty much every time. You know, pretty much every time. And uh, there's nothing I can do about it. And I have this allergy. And... I just don't, my liver just doesn't break down. It just doesn't work like normal drinkers. Fact. Can you accept that? Yeah, I can. Uh, this obsession, this, the, the, the problem really lies in my mind. That's where, that's where the problem really lies. Um, I, uh, I would have my little parties at night and then wake up the next day at 2 o'clock and, and swear off alcohol. Swear it off. I'm done. I am just so tired of this, I look like hell, I'm, I'm miserable, I'm done. And an hour later, seriously, an hour later, I have a drink in my hand. Or I've got my keys in my hand and I am going to the beer store. And I thought that I had changed my mind. I just changed my mind and decided to drink. And this man explained to me, no, you weren't. You have crossed that line into alcoholism and you cannot go back and you are not changing your mind, you have lost the power of choice. Because if you still have the choice, then choose no and don't drink. And do that every day for the rest of your life, and you are good to go. Don't know what you're doing here. But that wasn't the case. Um, He explained this obsession of the mind, that this time it is going to be different. I mean, after that last binge and I clean up and get better, and about two weeks later, you know, this internal... I'm, I, I'm feeling better. I'm looking better. I'm, I'm, people are forgiving me for the crap I've pulled. Um, things are just better. You've heard it called the, the pink cloud. Um, and slowly but surely, which I don't, I don't know where that says that in this book, but um, I, I believe that it's God's grace, absolutely. It gives us a little break. Um, 
slowly I start getting a little bit irritable, a little bit restless, and a little bit, a little bit pissy, and a little bit irritated, and I'm starting to think, you know, this person is really, you know, I'm starting to think that a drink, one, might not be such a bad idea, and I've been sober for a couple of weeks, so maybe it'll work this time, maybe. I was really making too much of a big deal about that last time, not a big, and I am drinking again, and I didn't understand that it's because I had lost the power of choice. I understood when this man was telling me this. I, uh, it made perfect sense to me. And um, he took me to page 24, um, where it says this, that I've lost the power of choice. But I'm going to read it anyway. In fact, um, this is my truth. I've, I've written in here in my book that, that this is this is. The defin- this is the truth about alcoholism, and this is the truth about me, this paragraph in italics. The fact is that most alcoholics, I actually scratched that out and put my name in there, <laughs> most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. It's telling me in black and white, I have lost the power of choice. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We're unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago, we're without defense against the first drink. No defense. I'm not able to bring into my consciousness with the kind of force that I need to that's going to keep me away from that next drink. I remember waking up in jail. I remember how bad it smelled. I remember everything about it. I remember being scared to death. I remember using a roll of toilet paper as a pillow for my head. I remember how crowded it was. I remember all that stuff. Two weeks later, actually four weeks later, what am I doing? I am drinking and driving again. And I am arrested again. Horrible experience again. Horrible, horrible, horrible. What am I doing two months later? I cannot bring into my mind, into my memory, I can't remember with the kind of force I need to to keep me away from picking up that next drink, I am without defense that next for the, with that. I am without defense against that drink. So what I need is a defense. But I know my power. I have no power over it. This is what step one is all about. Thank God he explained that to me. It made sense. It gave me a ton of hope. And that's my only purpose of really harping on this right now. This is huge. This is step one. And I mean, I mean, this is alcoholism. Um, I learned a lot at this treatment center. I also got a lot of sleep and I got to do arts and crafts and all that kind of cool stuff. Met a lot of really great people, but I did. I learned a lot. Um, And there was some therapy there and I think I probably needed it. I do. I think I needed to talk about some other stuff, but it wasn't going to, it wasn't going to fix my alcoholism. It the step that had been very, very, very thoroughly explained to me. And it had been explained to me there what my book says about how we work these steps, why we work these steps, how we work these steps, when we work these steps. And uh, my experience was that a step a month was not working. And um, my friend at this treatment center pointed out words to me in this big book like next and at once, and immediately, and now, and uh, starting to make sense that I guess they mean now, <laughs> you know, doesn't translate as take your time and, and, and go slow and think about it and make sure you're ready, and I was absolutely 100% ready, and um, a, te- a step a month was, was just not working, so um, I left that treatment center and got a sponsor the very, I, I left, I went home and slept that day. <laughs> and uh, the very next day, I went to this group in Dallas, Texas, that uh, this man at the treatment center had sent me to. His brother was, was uh, chairing that meeting. And um, I got a sponsor there at that meeting, and I walked in the door, and uh, it was a group of about 150 people laughing, smiling, uh, they looked healthy, you know. Uh, there were like two people over here and three people over here, and with their big books out sitting on the table, and 
And it was like a, it was a sponsor and their protege going through the steps before the meeting. You know, we're doing some step work or whatever. And um, I just, you know, we sat down and, and, and I had my book. We sat down and we started studying the book line by line, page by page, and talking about it. And laughter. And um, it was just different than any other meeting I had ever been to. And I got a sponsor there. And um, the coolest, coolest thing is that... Um, she qualified me. She qualified me as an alcoholic to make sure I was the real deal. I totally could have just told her I'm the real deal, believe it. But she took me to page 44, those two questions on page 44. I just, I had never had anybody ask me in all these meetings that I'd gone to all my life. Never had anybody ask me those, those questions. If when you honestly, if when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or when drinking, you have little control over the amount you take. Check, check. <laughs> um, yeah. So she said, welcome to AA. And she told me, <laughs> she told me, if you want what I have, you will do what I did and what I tell you to do. And she also asked me if I was really, really done drinking for good and all. She didn't say one day at a time. Good and all, good and all. Do you really want to quit drinking or do you just want the bad stuff to stop happening? Do you just want the bad consequences and crap to stop happening? And I said, no, I really do want to quit drinking. And um, she was just very serious with me. You know, we, we did steps one, two, and three. She didn't pat me on the back and say, it's going to be okay. We're going to take our time. No. Oh, she said, if you want to do this, we're going to, we're going to do this. And she actually told me that the minute I balk at something she tells me to do, go find somebody else to work with. Don't waste her time. Sweetheart. She's an awesome, wonderful woman. She's still my sponsor today. <laughs> she's a great, great woman. But she loved me enough to tell me the truth. She loved me enough to not pat me on the back and say, you're going to be okay, sweetie. You're going to be okay. And this thing is a process. And we have to take our time because that's a lie. <laughs> it, 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 is a, it is a process. But I don't have, I don't have the time. You know, we don't have the time. This, I think that we forget that this disease killed. And um, I love the example. It's not my example. I, I can't remember who I first heard it from, but the example of, um, you know, if the doctor told you that you had cancer and that you needed to be at the hospital on Monday morning at 8 o'clock to start chemo, would you say, no, you know what, I stay up real late on Sunday nights and I might not, I might be pretty tired and I think I'll just Maybe I'll show up on Wednesday. I mean, it's a great example because the urgency of a disease like cancer to get to, to get help, oh, my gosh, we're going to do it. We've, we've, if that's the solution, we're going to jump on it. Alcoholism kills more people, I believe, than all cancers combined. That's what I've heard. I haven't looked that up. That's what I've heard. So why don't we treat it the same? There is somebody dying right this second. Right this second. Right this second, you know, um, and it just and they just don't have to. That's why I get so passionate about it. Is they just don't have to, but a lot of people just don't know uh, what the solution is. Um, sponsor told me the truth. We got through steps one, two, and three in one day. Um, she gave me my four step stuff, and she told she explained it to me. And she's going through the book with me this whole time. We're just doing it. We're just doing it in a timely manner. Um, because I gotta get that moment, I gotta have that spiritual experience that she's talked about. If my problem is powerlessness, my solution is power, and it's gotta be a power greater than me. And, uh, I was dying to get to that power. And I didn't even really believe how it was gonna work, how, what, you know, on step two came to believe. I don't have to believe at that point. I just have to be willing to believe that something move on so I can, so, you know, so I can get connected to that power and, and get well, that keep that momentum going. We'll talk about all that tomorrow. Um, got through the step very, very quickly. Um, and, uh, I'll tell you what, when I realized that I had recovered, I had made two amends. And when I realized that I had, that I had recovered, um, it was not a big, huge, you know, there were no uh, sparkles or, or um, you know, unicorns flying around or anything like that. It was, uh, it was a feeling of, oh, my gosh, everything's going to be okay. 
I haven't thought about a drink in weeks, and everything's going to be okay. Uh, but I knew that I needed to give back to, did I want to? <laughs> no, honestly, I thought it was going to take up a lot of time to, to, to sponsor people and all that. Are you kidding me? I'm scared to death. Um, I'm going to share with y'all. What time is this over? What time is this over? I do have time to tell you. <laughs> uh, the amends process. You know, I got through four, did my four steps, sat down with my sponsor, did the fifth, six, seven, eight, nine, pretty easy stuff. Um, and uh, made a couple of amends, realized that I was, I was recovered. Um, but uh, I'm going to tell you all a little something interesting. But let me go, let me real fast tell you what these, these promises and the tenth step, because that's about, you know, ninth step, tenth step, when, when I realize this. The promises that come true. Um, you know, we hear the promises read in meetings, and there are promises for every step. Lots of promises for every step. And uh, the ones that I love are the ones that, that tell us that, we, uh, that the problem's been removed from us, that the obsession is gone. Uh, so I want to read those to you. For those that, the word recovered is throughout this book. But uh, this is like the definition of recovered to me, these promises on page 84. And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. For by this time, sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor. And if we're tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally, and we will find that this has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. That's the miracle of it. We feel as though we've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We've not even sworn it off. Instead, the problem's been removed. It does not exist for us. Sounds like recovered to me. <laughs> this is how we react. We are ne neither cocky nor are we afraid. This is our experience. So this is their experiences and what they think might happen, this is what they hope might happen, this is what happens to them. That is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition, as long as, if, if, we, you know, it's easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. We're headed for trouble if we do, for alcohol is a subtle foe. We're not cured of alcoholism. So anybody says, oh, you're calling yourself recovered. You think you're cured. No, my book tells me I'm not cured. Uh, but what I do have is a daily reprieve, contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. Uh, I know that for somebody that couldn't stay sober, and I, and I actually timed it one time, seven minutes. I could take a drink in the end. I could take a drink, and I would be okay for about seven minutes. And I would start feeling scared, unsure, paranoid. Who's talking about me? <laughs> um, you know, what time? Just had to have a drink, seven minutes. I know that standing here at four and a half years sober, I am not keeping my ass sober. There's no way. There's no way. If I continue to live in steps 10, 11, and 12, to the best of my ability, I'm going to stay sober. I do not know, and this is the honest truth, I do not know of one person, one friend of mine, one that I associate with, that has worked these steps as they are laid out in this book and that lives by 10, 11, and 12, and has relapsed. I don't know of one. Uh, now, when I was a couple months sober, my sponsor wanted me to go carry the message. She said it was time. I would go, but I, would, I was so scared. And I was so, she was going to this hospital, this, my home group back in Dallas, they have a, a list of 50 different places, 50 different opportunities that they go carry the message at on a weekly basis. And uh, I was signed up for a couple of them. I was made to sign. I really thought I was going to get away with not having to do step 12. But uh, um, 
still selfish and self-centered. I mean, you know. But uh, God, what a joy it is. I can't believe I ever thought that. But she, um, I lied a couple times and said I left my book at home and left my book in my car so I can't actually say anything. But I'm here. You know, <laughs> I'm here at the hospital. Uh, and I just couldn't get over myself. And I just couldn't understand, I just couldn't, I still had not understood that, that it was about giving hope to that other person. And that, that I, I had not experienced enough of giving back that we receive. I hadn't experienced that yet, so I was still kind of in this, in this, it was just fear. It was just all about fear. But the thing is, is I had stopped 10 stepping, so I wasn't, when I was in fear, I wasn't talking about it, I wasn't getting honest about it, I wasn't asking God to remove it. I was I was not getting out of myself and turning my thoughts to somebody else. I wasn't doing that. I uh, made up an excuse every single time because I did not want to meet her at the hospital to carry the message. She asked me to tell my story somewhere, and I, I lied. I don't remember what I said, but I lied. And um, made up something why I couldn't do it. And um, I stopped praying. Um, I got a job. <laughs> and I um, I just... I just, the 12 step thing was just a little bit too much for me. I don't have to do that. Um, seven days later, I'm drunk. And I also realized that I had left out something huge in my fourth step <laughs> that was all about, it was all based around fear. So it's very important to be honest in your fourth step or it doesn't mean anything. I mean, uh, if the point of it is to get to the truth, but we're not honest in it, <laughs> It's not going to work. So I, I, but my point is, I was full of fear, stopped talking to God, didn't 10 step, um, lied, wouldn't carry the message. I end up drunk. Surprise, surprise. Uh, now you can't get me to shut up. <laughs> now you can't get me to be quiet about this program because I learned, um, in starting to sponsor people and starting to give back that not only do I get to stay sober, which is fantastic, the obsession that stays away. But what I get back is peace of mind, usefulness, the feeling of usefulness, um, a cool conversation with my mom on the phone that I'm not irritated and she's not bugging me. <laughs> and I really am interested in what she's doing and how she and what's going on with her and her husband and not so concerned about me. Um, I get uh, friends that want to be around me. I want to be around other people. I can look people in the eye. Um, self-esteem. Um, I'm interested in. I'm interested in things. Uh, there was something on TV the other night, and it was like something that I would never be interested in, and I was just like fascinated with it. It made me think I would have never cared about. I can't even remember what it is. But um, something to do with airplanes, and, you know, it just, it, I, I was interested, and it was like, this is, how cool that all these things that we ignored because we isolated, because we, all these things and opportunities, like a commercial, you know, can come up, and we can actually be thinking about something like that and not ourselves, you know, and we can be thinking about other people and, and how we can help them, and I'm telling you what, to... To watch somebody recover, there is nothing like it. And I didn't get that. My sponsor used to say that, that Angie, it's, it's the greatest thing ever. You know, it's the bright spot of my life when you call. I always thought I was bugging her. And, and I'd love to help because you're helping me get out of me. And, and I want to help you. And I'm like, you better get a life. <laughs> because if I'm the bright spot of your day, you know. But I get it now. I... I totally understand it now. Um, a girl that I sponsor who just celebrated nine months, she's, she's here in a fifth step on, on Monday or on Sunday, and she's so excited, and she called me to tell me, and I just wanted to cry because I, I, I hear it in her voice how, how her thought is on somebody else, and it's not on her. And it's just, and if you don't get what I'm saying or you can't relate to her or it sounds corny and stupid, it's because you haven't done it maybe. You know, it's because you haven't done it. And um, I, I don't know. I, I've just had such a fascinating and, and wonderful life with issues and with problems and all. Um, but it's all been okay. 
You know, everything has all, because I, because I'm not relying on me. I'm not relying on me. And I mean, when I get into self, that's a kind of a scary place to be for too long, you know. Um, and all I gotta do is talk to God every day and just ask Him what He has for me. You know, and it's got a my understanding. You know, it, there's so much to this, and I can't wait for tomorrow if you guys can't tell. I can't wait for tomorrow to really get into this stuff. I know I'm jumping around. Um, but, you know, that's, that's my story, and ever since then I've been, I've, I, I got my sponsor back. She took me back after I, I, I drank, and we, we went through the steps again even faster. <laughs> and, um, and I was out there carrying the message before I, before I knew it. And, um, and I learned a lot from that. I learned a lot of humility. And I really learned where the power came from. And I, I, since that day, life's gotten better and better. And I've had friends in the program that have told me that. And, and it actually had, had given me hope. But then again, I'm like, really? <laughs> it gets better and better? But it does. It's just new experience and new growth, new growth spurts all the time, even the bad stuff. So don't get me wrong. i got problems. <laughs> but they're doable, you know? I don't even like to call them problems. They're situations. Their situation, learning, experience, situation. But uh, anyway, I, I am just so excited about tomorrow, and thank you guys so much for um, being patient. I know I talk fast, and I'm, I'm here and then there and then there. Um, my, <laughs> I tell my sponsor that I'm weird a lot. She knows it, but she says, Angie, the sooner you accept that, you're going to be a lot happier. <laughs> and she's right. And she said, besides, who said, who said weird is bad? Whoever said weird, goofy, silly, you know, whoever said it's bad is, is wrong. They're just wrong. But anyway, thank you guys so much, and um, look forward to hearing you tomorrow night, too. So, I appreciate y'all. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.